Number 1. Beverly Tomlinson, age 16, disappeared from Cresswell, Oregon on October 15, 1973. She was believed to be a runaway. Usually, I try to clean up all the evidence of my getting sidetracked from the case at hand, but this time I'm going to post the whole trail of where this case led me. First of all, the only information I could find regarding the circumstances of her disappearance is that she ran away with an unidentified unknown teenager. I thought that kind of odd, as Cresswell is a small town it currently has a population of approximately 5,000, I'd guess it would have been half that in 1973. It only has one high school, so I just thought it seemed strange that nobody would know who she ran away with. I figured it could be that the person was not local, possibly from Eugene, which is the nearest large city. Then, I found this site which, on Deborah's page, states that Samantha may travel to Portland and has several piercings. Did they mean to type Deborah, but typed the wrong name? Why did they have the name Samantha on their mind when typing it? Could that have been the friend's possible name? Or was the whole paragraph related to another case and somehow pasted on Deborah's page in error? I couldn't find any Samantha missing in Oregon. One of the first things I found that led to some confusion is that there was another Deborah Tomlinson who was the victim of a homicide in Colorado. It turned out that she was not this Deborah, though about the same age. Searching for Deborah among the living, using her own name, yielded nothing useful. So I started looking for others who had gone missing in Oregon during the same time frame, hoping someone might stand out as possibly being her runaway companion. I did find some missing women from around the same time, but only one, Rita Jolly, was a teenager. She was from the greater Portland area. Virginia Erickson, age 32, missing October 21, 1973, from Sweet Home, Oregon. Rita Jolly, age 17, missing June 29, 1973, from West Lynn, Oregon, presumed Bundy victim. Vicki Holler, age 24, missing August 20, 1973, from Eugene, Oregon, presumed Bundy victim. Suzanne Justice, age 23, missing November 5, 1973, from Portland, Oregon. Seeing that there were two likely Bundy victims in Oregon around the time of Deborah's disappearance, I couldn't help but consider that she may have also been a victim. It's been reported that Bundy was in the area at the time of Vicky's disappearance. However, this detailed Bundy timeline clearly shows he was in Seattle on the days of both Rita and Vicky's disappearances and was in Tacoma on the day of Deborah's. That doesn't necessarily mean he couldn't have traveled to Oregon on those days, but I'm not sure why they believe he did so. It's worth noting that Bundy confessed to many killings, including two in Oregon, one of whom is still unnamed. He did not confess to the murders of Rita Jolly or Vicky Holler, although I'm not sure if he specifically denied them or couldn't recall who the unnamed victim was. I became curious as to why Rita and Vicky were listed as Bundy victims, I wanted to see what information there was on Bundy's time in Oregon. I couldn't find anything. With that trail being a dead end, I started looking at the Uids in Oregon. The first one I came across was this one. I don't think this is Deborah, the hide is too far off. I did notice that this Uid was found in Sweet Home, which sounded familiar, because Virginia Erickson, mentioned above, went missing from there. I saw that Virginia wasn't ruled out and started comparing vitals. Hide is off by an inch, age range is correct, city is the same, so it almost seems too obvious they had to have looked into this, right? I've made a note to ask them. This Uid could possibly be Vicky Holler as well, so, back to Deborah. There are actually quite a few female Uids from that time period, many are partial remains and had been deceased for years before they were found. Deborah was 553 140 pounds at the time of her disappearance. Female, 18 to 99 yo, found in forested area East Lynn County, 427 1978, interval. Years female, 14 to 18 year old, found Williams, Josephine County, 59 1978, interval. Years female, 17 to 23 year old, found in Multnomah County Med Examiner's Office with no documentation, 1-1-1980, interval unknown, approx 563 female, 18 to 30 year old, found in Government Camp, 8-1986, interval. At least one year female, 19 to 45 year old, found in Field in Eastern Lynn County, 328-1996, interval. Years the first and the last from this list caught my attention because there were two of them found in the same general area and we know Deborah ran away with someone. Of course, we don't know if that person was never reported missing or if that person returned in a short time and really isn't missing. Of course, there still had to be one more distraction. The rule out list for the government camp who had found in 1986 contained some names I hadn't heard of. Jeannie Bennett, found an article here, Betty Johnson, from comments here, it appears she has been located deceased, Jean Palinkas, can't find anything about her. Jeannie, whose given name was Floyd, and Jean are both missing from Oregon and are not listed in NamUs or on any of the missing person sites. In any case, I have no idea what kinds of problems Deborah was having that might have led her to run away all those years ago, so there's no telling what the likelihood is that she's alive and well, just not wanting contact with her family and friends. 
I hope that's the case and that someday she will be found safe. Number 2. Lois Marta Darnapik, age 32, disappeared from Brooklyn, New York on or about April 9, 1989. She had been living in an apartment with her boyfriend and her father became concerned when he had not heard from her in several days. He checked her apartment and Lois was not there. He found the cat crying as if it hadn't been fed. Nothing else appeared out of place. Lois's father then contacted her boyfriend's parents, who said their son had been in contact with them, but they did not know anything about Lois. According to Namus, the NYPD would not take a report or even act as the law enforcement contact for this case. They claimed that they did not have the resources. Instead, Namus's investigating agency section refers to a K. Tontarski as the law enforcement contact and directs us to their contacts page for more information. Unfortunately, the contacts page has no information whatsoever on K. Tontarski. After a bit of research, it appears that K. Tontarski is a forensic scientist out of a lab in Washington, D.C. She apparently picked up the ball when nobody else would. It seems she is taking care of the DNA samples and dental charts, which I am very grateful for. Based on the information in NamUs, her family attempted to file a report in July 1989 and again in February 1990. Alas, there is no case number for Lois. So, who investigated her disappearance? Who interviewed her friends and her boyfriend? Who checked the apartment for possible clues? My guess is that no one did, no one is, and no one plans to. From what little I could gather about Lois's family, her father was a long-time resident of New York, definitely a taxpayer and a contributing member of society. He had a right to law enforcement services when his daughter went missing. Things have changed since 1989. Most states, if not all, now have laws which require them to take a report when a person is missing. I hope that Lois's family will go back and insist that they take a report and investigate what should have been investigated 25 years ago. I don't see any record that her parents have died, but her father would be 89 years old now. I do not know if she has any siblings. I don't believe she had any children. DNA is in process, and I hope it will bring much needed answers. Number 3. Ellen Diamond, age 48, disappeared from Tilden Township, Michigan on June 28, 1981. Helen and her husband Roy had spent the afternoon at a picnic in Balgam with other family members. Once the picnic ended, they headed to the Tilden Club, a private social gathering place for local residents. Their daughter and son-in-law joined them at the club for a while, but left after a while to go out for pizza and then head home. Helen and Roy remained at the club. There came a time when Roy was ready to leave and he approached Helen, saying it was time to go. As they were leaving, an acquaintance offered them a ride home as both Roy and Helen were intoxicated, but they declined. They exited the club together and headed across the parking lot to their car. According to Roy, an argument had occurred between himself and Helen as they walked to the car and as a result, he told Helen that she could walk home and drove off without her. Helen went back into the club angry, using profanities while announcing that her husband had just left without her. According to fellow club attendees, Helen later left alone and said she was going to walk to her son, Roy Jr.'s house, less than a mile away. It should have been an approximately 13-minute walk. It was not unusual for Helen to go to her son's house during arguments, although it's been stated that most of their arguments occurred while one or both of them was intoxicated and by the following morning, she was always anxious to get home. She has never been seen again. There were potential sightings of Helen that night, but none of them were followed up on at the time. This was partly due to the fact that law enforcement assumed she had left voluntarily. Also hindering things, however, was a trivial matter which I believe made a big difference in how this case played out. In the days immediately following Helen's disappearance, witnesses reported that Helen left the club just after 2 a.m. Others said they had seen Helen walking down the road toward her son's house, but the timeline was not making sense. It later turned out that she had left the club much later than 2 a.m., but club members had said it was 2 a.m., fearing that the club could get into trouble for serving alcohol after 2 o'clock. These witnesses later corrected their statements, but while one person now said it was around 3 a.m., another said it was 5 minutes to 4, as the club was locking its doors. Two witnesses may have seen Helen walking down the road. One claimed he was sure it was her, another said she saw someone, but wasn't able to identify them. Both witnesses were on their way home from the club where Helen had been. Another man, who was not affiliated with the club, had told people that Helen had been in their living room that night for a short time and had told him they were going to a camp. It is not clear who might be the second person referred to when he used the term they. It's possible that this witness said she had stopped there to use the telephone. There was a party going on in the house at the time and the house would have been on her way to her son's house. Very little is known about this potential sighting, it was not taken seriously when relayed to law enforcement. They did not interview him, for they said he was mentally retarded. They did, however, interview the owner of the house, who claimed to have no knowledge of Helen ever having been there. 
It would later be learned that the owner was upstairs partying with friends and had the music blasting. He would not have heard a visitor in the living room. The man who reported seeing her was apparently the only one who was downstairs. The next lead involved a male civilian who dove into a mine pit, following up on a rumor that Helen had been hit by a car and her body dumped there. He contacted law enforcement as well, but instead of following up on the lead, they noted that he was an alcoholic, presumably finding the tip not to be credible. Yet another witness, an avid outdoorsman very familiar with the area, reported having seen wide tire tracks in a clearing not far from the Tilden Club. He found it odd, as cars never drove in there and he contacted police. The police searched the area, finding a women's loafer shoe, a hole containing a rolled-up mattress, and some deer bones. Helen's family did not know about the shoe until years later, by which time the evidence had been discarded, with no opportunity for the shoe to be identified or ruled out as belonging to Helen. Helen's purple jacket, a windbreaker, was found and identified as hers by multiple relatives, however, police did not take that seriously either. The jacket was reportedly found off of a roadway in a remote area and did not appear to have been out in the elements, as long as Helen had been missing therefore, law enforcement did not believe it was hers. It's worth noting that her family members had recognized the unusual buttons and the fact that the drawstring had been removed, both characteristic of Helen's jacket. It's also worth noting that original newspaper reports of Helen's disappearance had gotten the jacket color wrong. It was initially reported to be maroon. It was just after that error had been corrected and described as a purple jacket that the jacket itself was found. It's been speculated that whomever had the jacket worried that it could be linked to Helen's disappearance once the newspaper was reporting a purple jacket and quickly disposed of it at that point. There were some other crimes against women in the area during that time. Two weeks after Helen's disappearance, a woman was assaulted as she entered her home. She was able to fight him off. Four months after Helen's disappearance, a woman named Barbara Kesson was murdered in her mobile home. The suspect in this case died in an accident a few months later. It is unknown if either of these cases are connected to Helen's or to each other. Approximately six years after Helen's disappearance, her daughter received a call from an acquaintance who believed his mother's boyfriend was responsible for harming Helen and suggested a location where her body may be found. He said he had signed a sworn affidavit. This lead, as far as I can tell, was not followed up either, again, presumably because the individual who had supplied this information was intoxicated at the time. The case has long gone cold and all evidence was discarded years ago, preventing any testing on the jacket or the mysterious shoe. Many people who might have been able to provide information are now deceased. All of Helen's family members were cleared of any involvement. It's worth noting, too, that Helen's family is not alone in their frustration at trying to navigate the red tape in Michigan. While it's unbelievable to me that they would consider a lead non-credible due to alcoholism, mental illness, or simply being under the influence, I admit I'm not surprised. Michigan also holds the honor of sentencing 15-year-old Rose Cole to a violent California cult after she ran away from home. Rose Cole has been missing since 1973, and Michigan officials have not cooperated with her family, in spite of the fact that she was in their custody, and therefore they were responsible for her safety. It would also be Michigan who ordered Ida Dean Richardson Anderson to a state mental hospital in 1958 to determine if she was fit to have custody of her children. She wrote a letter to family members from the hospital and has never been heard from again. If there are any records that Ida ever left the hospital, Michigan would not reveal this fact to Ida's son. Ida had no history of mental illness, although she had recently been hospitalized for rheumatic fever and was a single mother. Helen's family is doing a great deal to try to find information on her fate and I do hope that something useful will surface soon. She has to be somewhere. Number 4. Pamela Hobley, age 17, left, and Patricia Spencer, age 16, right, were last seen in Escota, Michigan on October 31, 1969. At approximately 2 p.m., amidst a bomb threat at Escota High School on River Road, Pamela and Patricia walked off the school's grounds, down River Road toward downtown. They planned on attending the homecoming game that evening, but did not show up. For decades, it had been consistently reported that the two girls were last seen walking down River Road, away from the school. Recently, however, a man went to police and explained that he had given the girls a ride to a gas station at River Road and Interstate 23 on that day. Investigators were puzzled as there was nothing in the file regarding the statement. The man claimed that he had been questioned extensively at the time and that he didn't understand why news reports kept insisting they were last seen walking from the school. Over the years, many rumors have circulated about the fate of Pamela and Patricia. Among them was a persistent account of them being killed by two men and buried under a barn belonging to a Jack Searle, but investigators found no indication that this lead was ever checked out. In 2011, a search was done at the property with cadaver dogs and backhoes, but nothing was found. Jack Searle, then owner of the barn in Wilbur Township, is now deceased. 
His property had a reputation as a popular party spot for teens in 1969. It is unknown whether the rumors pertaining to the barn also implicated Mr. Searle as a suspect. There is also chatter about the girls having experimented with alcohol and drugs around the time of their disappearance, a rumor which Pamela's younger sister subtly confirmed by saying she did a lot of things my mom didn't like. I've also seen unsubstantiated and vague blurbs about a peace sign charm having been found, which could be related to this case. Patricia Spencer was last known to be wearing one. Lastly, a reporter named Ron Collins as someone police would like to question regarding this case. Ron Collins was reportedly a resident of Flint, Michigan, and was a member of a band who would perform in Escoda. It is unknown what connection he had to either of the girls, if any. Pamela had a boyfriend at the time of her disappearance and had recently become engaged. Neither of the girls had their purses or any change of clothes when they vanished. Their families, as well as the current detective on the case, believe they were victims of foul play. It's worth noting that Escoda is a small town with a current population of about 900 people. Although I do not believe the cases are connected, Charlotte Loomis, another Escoda teenager, vanished in 1972. Since Charlotte had many siblings, I would be surprised if the Spencer and Hobley families weren't acquainted with the Loomis family. Number 5. Annette Camahel, age 20, was last seen near the 101 northbound on-ramp in Cotati, California on April 25, 1972. Jeanette was a student at Santa Rosa Junior College at the time of her disappearance and regularly hitchhiked from the Cotati on-ramp in order to attend classes. All media accounts agree that Jeanette was a good student and that there would be no reason for her to have left of her own accord. She lived in an apartment on Sierra Avenue in Cotati with a roommate and it was she that reported Jeanette missing when she did not return home on April 25. A witness stated that they saw Jeanette get into a faded brown 1970-1972 pickup truck driven by a Caucasian male with an Afro hairstyle. She was never heard from again. Jeanette is one of eight young women who disappeared from the Santa Rosa area in 1972-1973 that were believed to be hitchhiking. The cases are all believed to be connected, although no suspect has been identified. The other seven women were found deceased, victims of homicide. There has been speculation that the Zodiac Killer, whose identity is also unknown, or even Ted Bundy, may have been responsible for the Santa Rosa Hitchiker murders. In July 1979, the body of a woman was found on Calistoga Road in Santa Rosa, 100 yards from where Laurie Cursa, another suspected Hitchiker victim had been found previously. Therefore, it is suspected by law enforcement that this unidentified woman was yet another victim of the Hitchiker murders. It has been falsely reported and repeated that Jeanette's body was found in 1979 however, this body has not been identified as Jeanette. In fact, she was ruled out long ago based on dentals. Admittedly, my first thought was are they sure it's not Jeanette? I mean, if they're labeling this victim a hitchhiker victim, that tells me that the remains could well have been there since 1972 to 1973. This who it is not on Namus, so there aren't a lot of details available. I don't know of anyone else who fits the Hitchiker profile, except possibly Eileen Heinsohn, who didn't go missing until 1976, and it is unknown whether she was hitchhiking. According to this excellent site about the Santa Rosa Hitchiker murders, as of October 2009, investigators were taking another look, using DNA to confirm that this deceased woman was not Jeanette. Five years later, it seems we have no answers one way or the other. Jeanette grew up in a military family and moved around a lot. She graduated high school in Yokohama, Japan, prior to traveling to California and enrolling in college. According to The Last Place You'd Look by Carol Moore, American students in Japan were shielded from the anti-war movement, the hippie counterculture, and most popular music of the time. The author, who attended high school with Jeanette in Japan, described the culture as comparable to 1950s, as opposed to late 1960s early 1970s. Following the disappearance of Jeanette, a group of concerned fellow students initiated a carpool program to match drivers with students who needed rides in order to prevent students from hitchhiking. This program led to several female students coming forward to tell of their bad experiences while hitchhiking. Most of these students, particularly those who were sexually assaulted, had not reported the attacks to police but gave the group a description of their attacker and vehicle so others would be wary of accepting rides from them. Could any of these descriptions have matched the person seen with Jeanette? hoping for a definite answer on whether the 1979 remains are indeed Jeanette.